an estimated 80% of all individuals who contract coronavirus will not need to be hospitalized. What's up everyone? My name's Mitch. Thank you so much for checking out this video. So today we're going to be talking all about COVID-19. Yes, that word has been striking fear into nearly every one of us worldwide, but I wanted to make a video explaining some of the science behind COVID-19, as well as what you can do to help combat the disease. As always, there'll be timestamps here at the beginning of the video, so feel free to jump around to whatever interests you the most. So today's video will be broken down into four parts. Part one, will be what exactly is coronavirus. Part two will be the mechanism by which coronavirus infects people and ultimately makes them really, really sick. And I'm including this in this video because I really think being familiar with this concept will help you understand why certain precautionary measures have been taken and why ventilators are so important. Part three, we'll talk a little bit about some common misconceptions about coronavirus. And part four, we'll talk about some ways in which you can augment your health at this time. So let's dive in. So what exactly is coronavirus? Coronavirus is actually a family of viruses that normally cause the common cold. The official name for the coronavirus that causes COVID-19 is actually SARS-CoV-2, which actually stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus Number 2 kind of a mouthful. So the coronavirus is hypothesized to originally come from bats. And it's also believed that this virus started in Wuhan, China. So what exactly does COVID-19 stand for? This is actually an acronym for the disease that the coronavirus causes. The acronym stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019, but obviously shortened to COVID-19 because that's also way easier to say. Moving on. So how does COVID-19 infect an individual and actually make them really sick. Coronavirus is a respiratory virus that affects your lungs and breathing. Every time you take a deep breath in, air travels from your nose and your mouth down through your trachea into your lungs. So you actually have two tubes in your throat that connect two different things. One is called your esophagus that connects your mouth to your stomach. The other is the trachea that is your breathing system. So when you breathe in coronavirus, it'll go down your trachea into your lungs. Your lungs have a bunch of tiny little holes or sacs in them called alveoli. And this alveoli is the site of gas exchange where oxygen is exchanged for carbon dioxide. So every time you inhale, you're taking in oxygen from the environment it goes into your mouth, down your trachea, into your lungs, into these little alveoli, where it is then exchanged for carbon dioxide. And then when you exhale, the carbon dioxide goes up your trachea, out your mouth, and into the environment around you. And again, the alveoli being the spot of the gas exchange, this is where oxygen goes from the environment into the rest of your body. Now your lungs and your alveoli are coated with this goop called surfactant. And this surfactant allows your lungs to fill with oxygen easier, as well as preventing those little alveoli sacs from collapsing. The specific cell that creates this important surfactant is called a type 2 pneumocyte. Again, the name is irrelevant, but it's a specific type of lung cell. And this is important because this is the type of cell that the coronavirus actually attaches to. And once it attaches to the cell, it'll move into the cell and replicate inside of the cell. And then like when the cops bust an underage drinking party, that virus and all of its friends get out of the cell as fast as they can. And in doing so, it actually kills the cell. And you have thousands of these cells all throughout your lungs. So if the virus is infecting and killing thousands of these different cells all at once, your body being super smart recognizes that something's wrong. So your body amounts a huge immune response that leads to inflammation within your lungs. So now in your lungs, your body has all these white blood cells, cell debris, dead cells, parts of the virus floating around, and the job of your immune system is to clear your body of all this muck. Well, what happens when a lot of this stuff gets collected in your lungs? Those little precious alveoli sacs begin to be filled with fluid. That fluid contains 
cellular debris, white blood cells, parts of the virus, all that stuff that I was just talking about. And this is actually how pneumonia forms. So there's actually two problems that occur when this happens. Number one, having all of those little alveoli sacs in your lungs fill up with fluid actually starts to stiffen your lungs or cause a reduction in lung compliance in fancy schmancy terms. And then number two, fluid is in the way of gas exchange. When you can't exchange gas, oxygen can't get to your body. Surprise, you need oxygen to live. And when you can't have the proper oxygen exchange, that's when problems occur. This can lead to something called ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome. When you get to this point, it's really hard to breathe on your own. Again, at this point, this is when you need to be in an ICU and most likely hooked up to a mechanical ventilator that will breathe for you. This is why having a shortage of ventilators is such a big deal. It's lack of oxygen in your lungs that leads to a lack of oxygen throughout the rest of your body and ultimately causes multi-organ failure. So this is how coronavirus can make you really, really sick and potentially lead to fatal outcomes. So now that you know the mechanism of infection, and how coronavirus can make you really, really sick, let's talk about some common misconceptions about the virus. An estimated 80% of all individuals who contract coronavirus will not need to be hospitalized. That being said, about 20% will need to be hospitalized. And about half of that, or 10% of everyone who gets sick, will need to be in an ICU or intensive care unit. And then about half of that population will require mechanical ventilation. So an estimated 5% of everyone who gets infected with coronavirus will require mechanical ventilators. Now 5% may initially not sound like a lot, but when you have hundreds of thousands of people getting infected, 5% of hundreds of thousands of people is a lot of people that are going to require mechanical ventilators. Again, that's why not having enough mechanical ventilators is so important. And the shortage becomes even more critical the more people that are infected. Again, I just want to reiterate, about 95% of all people that contract the coronavirus will not need a mechanical ventilator. Again, these are just current estimates. These numbers may change slightly. So another big misconception is how this virus is actually transmitted from person to person. It's actually transmitted via respiratory droplets. So whenever anyone coughs or sneezes, that moist, beautifully disgusting mist that protrudes from their mouth, that's where the virus lives in those little tiny droplets. It's not aerosolized. Again, if it were, the masks really wouldn't help you that much. There's a lot of hype in the media that say that this virus can live in the air for up to three hours. However, there's no evidence to support that those genetic fragments can actually make you sick with the coronavirus. Because these droplets can't defy the laws of gravity, they fall onto surfaces. So direct contact is another way that you can get the virus. So you touch something where coronavirus is just chilling and hanging out, and congrats, you now have coronavirus on your hand. And then when you go to pick your nose when no one's looking, please don't pick your nose. Then you'll transfer the coronavirus in your nose and the rest is history. Can pets transmit COVID-19? Know from the perspective that pets don't seem to be contracting coronavirus, but yes, because of what we just talked about. So if someone sneezes into their hand and then goes and pets your cute little golden doodle and you go to pick up your cute little golden doodle and give him a kiss on the face, congratulations, you are now infected. Should you wear a mask anytime you go out in public? As of today, the answer is yes, per the CDC guidelines with multiple studies to support this. They recommend using cloth masks as surgical masks and those N95 masks should be reserved for healthcare professionals that need them. For more myth debunking or questions you may have, please visit the CDC or the World Health Organization websites. So now let's move on to some things you can do to improve your overall state of health. So starting with your physical well-being, one of the best things you can do right now is hydrate, hydrate, hydrate with water. I'm not saying drink a bunch of alcohol. The more water you can drink, the better. This will help clear and flush out your system. Number two in physical well-being is to optimize your immune system. And you can do this by focusing on three areas of your health. These include sleep, 
diet and exercise. So starting with sleep, you should be getting more sleep than you normally get. Sleep needs are highly variable from individual to individual, but estimates are between seven and nine hours. Secondly, dieting or healthy eating. Try to eat whole foods and foods that are rich in vitamins like fruits and vegetables. Try to cook as much as you can and stay away from all the processed foods. Processed foods definitely do not optimize your immune system. And number three is exercise. Even getting out and walking around your neighborhood or walking down the street a few times is super beneficial. So now for mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being, there's a few things you can do. So one of the biggest things and most beneficial things you can do is stay off the internet and limit yourself to all the negativity that's going around right now. Try to reframe your mind and reframe your heart into a state of positivity as best you can every day. Adding on to that, do the things you love to do but didn't have time to do before. Find a new hobby or a new creative outlet that you can do that will bring you joy and peace. And finally, lack of socialization at a time like this can be a really big problem for all of us. Make sure you prioritize times connecting with people that you live with. And if you don't currently live with anyone, set up some e-dates with friends or family using any form of electronic face-to-face -face connection methods that are out there. Maintaining some sort of social connection with people is extremely important for your mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Plus, it really helps with reducing stress and anxiety levels. Again, thank you so much for checking out this video. If you have any questions at all, feel free to leave a comment down below. Again, thank you. Please stay safe and I'll catch you all in the next one.